good evening and uh, thank you very much for joining us. Um, as Mark says, it's our fifth in the series of conservation lectures and tonight we're going a little bit more local to home. So we've had some fantastic international flavours and we are very close to home in rivers and lakes tonight talking about um, our native white claw crayfish. So I thought I might start with uh, a little bit about me, who I am, how did I get here today, uh, what makes me the UK Conservation Manager here at Bristol Zoological Society. Well, it all started really with a goldfish in a bowl. Well, not actually a bowl, but a proper tank. Um, I was fascinated um, with fish as a small child, and then that progressed to lots of other things. I just like to keep uh, lots of things in water. So this sort of led me on to being an ichthyologist, which is a kind of fishy person by trade. And then I went to do study zoology um, as an undergrad at the University of Bristol. And that led me on to various voluntary jobs in Africa. And then I went to work in public aquariums, uh, Vancouver and various aquariums in the UK. Then I sort of decided to lay my hat at uh, Bristol Zoo Gardens and that was actually 23 years ago. I became their aquarium curator. And the zoo were fantastic. And 10 years in, they sponsored me to do my masters at the University of Reading. And so I did a wildlife and conservation degree and that really spurred me on to develop our native species conservation, doing all sorts of fantastic projects such as water bowls until I kind of rested on the crayfish. And then that brought me full loop again and the zoo has allowed me to go back to the University of Bristol where I'm doing my thesis and basically finishing off a PhD. So that's kind of how we got here. And if you've watched any of the other lectures, you will know that the Bristol Zoological Society, we've got a lot of fantastic global conservation programs. We've, uh, they all stem from the conservation master plan. So we have a strategy and we work out where best to utilize our expertise and resources. Now closer to home, as I've alluded to, we have our native species conservation. And I think sometimes um, our members and our visitors are quite surprised by this, that we actually do a lot of conservation right here in the UK. I've always been a firm believer that conservation really starts on your doorstep. And so we work in the Avon Gorge, uh, monitoring the Silky Wave there, which is the only population in the UK. And even today, uh, Neil, one of my colleagues and I, were out in this incredible heat wave searching for uh, Silky Wave. It's the only place in the UK that, in, sorry, in England that they live. But we also sponsor the Education Biodiversity Officer and have done for over two decades now in the Gorge, recognising we have this fantastic triple SI on the doorstep of Bristol Zoo Gardens. But it doesn't stop there. We do toad patrols, really campaigning for volunteers to help those amphibians go back to their ancestral ponds in spring to go and breed. And we also do a lot of native um, species plant work as well, reintroducing rare plants. We've got a fantastic horticultural team based at Wild Place, and they work very hard to make sure that we can restore native plants as well. And this sort of the counter to that is our invasive work, working with invasive weeds, working with invasive species, trying to do control. And then all of this, there's an overarching element to this, where both basically the Bristol Zoo Gardens and Wild Place, we have native species strategies for both these, um, both of our um, zoos. And these, what they do is they recognize that it's not just about those uh, animals in the enclosures, it's also about those animals that live around them. So we make sure that we restore habitats and that we mitigate and that we basically make sure that our biodiversity on site isn't compromised. So we do a lot of surveying as well, right inside our zoos. However, tonight I'm gonna to tell you a little about, bit about one of our projects, which we have been working on for over a decade now, the white claw crayfish. Now I thought probably the best way to introduce it was to actually show you one. So um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen uh, so that you get me in big and we're going to see how this works. And Mark's going to help me out if it all goes horribly wrong. Okay. I have every faith. Okay. So I'm... Oh. Now can we see this? Mark, you'll tell me. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to hold this up to the screen. Can we see? Mark, are you Perfect. seeing that nicely? Yeah. Okay, so this is our white claw crayfish. So it looks very much like a lobster, but it's actually a freshwater crayfish. Lobsters are marine. 
And it's basically called a decapod because it's got 10 walking legs. But the first two are modified into what we call chelopeds, their claws. And the rest of them, they use for walking. Except these two ones, I don't know if you can, can you see that? Sorry, I'm not very good yes. with my camera. So they've got little pincers and they use that to basically forage around their environment. They've got these big antenna that they can basically use to sense where they're going. And they actually grow by splitting and growing a new shell. So they basically jackknife out of this bit here and they will basically leave the carapace and grow by pumping themselves up when soft with uh, water and then hardening off. So they need a good environment, lots of calcium. Now this one is captive bred here. And basically I, I should, um, should say that um, it's, this is completely, there's no welfare issue here. I have a hatchery at home and I'll explain more in, the, in, in a bit more detail about this. But I thought I'd bring you, so this one uh, was born here at my house about uh, five, four years ago with this one. And it's about half the total size that it will be. Now she's a female and she has this nice big tail and she's gonna basically, so what they do is they only breed once a year. And what they do is they breed around uh, autumn time, they have to come together and she will lay her eggs under her tail and then she will curl it up for about nine months. That's how long the incubation period is until the next spring where the animals will hatch on her. So this is our crayfish. So I'm gonna pop her back in her water because I've got a tub of water just down here because I don't want to stress her too much. But I thought that would be a good way to introduce you to what I'm talking about tonight. Thanks, Jeff. I'm gonna bear with me when I share my screen again. I've now got really wet hands. Oh. I'm just gonna ask very quickly, um, everybody who's um, watching the presentation, can, when Jen presented the crayfish, could you see her screen uh, taking up most of the Zoom, uh, the Zoom screen? You, could, you can make a comment in the chat if you wish. Yes, okay, fantastic, thank you very much. Yes, so that, that worked fine, did it? Yeah. Yes. Right, so they, they basically, so these crayfish, they live in uh, lakes and rivers. And um, as I say, they live to about 10 years old and they're a keystone species, which means if you take them out of the rivers and lakes, they can, that can cause a really bad effect that can take out, it's a very, very important part of the food chain and part of the ecosystem. We actually call them ecosystem engineers, not quite as big and significant as a beaver, but still very important to our environment. Now, what's the problem with crayfish? I mean, I just need to. So they are found throughout uh, Europe. So they're only basically found in Europe. And the UK is a stronghold, but we're actually endangered under the IUCN listing. It's actually endangered throughout its range. You'll find um, that they're not native to Scotland, only native to England, Wales, and also to Ireland. Now the problems, why are they declined? Well, it's the usual suspects. We've had habitat fragmentation, water pollution. We kind of call them the corals of the freshwater world. They really don't like, they're susceptible to things like nitrates, high phosphates, but also habitat fragmentation has been a problem where we've had weirs and barriers and populations have become really small and isolated. But the biggest threat to the white core crayfish are invasive crayfish species such as the signal crayfish. Now this is an American species that was brought in in the, in the mid 1970s into farms around Somerset for the food industry. And not only is it bigger and more brutish, so our animal will grow to about 10, 12 centimeters maximum length. So the one you saw there, that little female, she's about half the size of a fully grown one. But these signal crayfish can grow up to 20 centimeters, so almost twice as big. They're much more aggressive and they also carry something called crayfish plague. Now this is of a particular concern to our crayfish because it's um, basically lethal to them. It's a kind of fungal water mold and not any of the populations that we have seen in England that get it actually survive. And within two weeks it can wipe out an entire population. Not only this, but they can cause economic concern as well. They can cause flooding by burrowing deep into the riverbanks. So where you're in low lying conditions, this can be, have implications, but also they can take out large fish. Our little chap, he doesn't really eat anything other than small invertebrates. These big guys, they will attack even big salmonids plus the eggs as well. So they can cause real fishery collapse as well. 
And sometimes you get what we term a biological desert. When so many of them are in the environment, they strip it bare of everything, all vegetation and vertebrates. So they can cause a real problem. However, and this is the doomy bit, of the, the story's gonna get better, I promise you, but this is the kind of gloomy bit. It doesn't just stop with a signal crayfish. We've actually got a few others. So these chaps, these are all from North America, and at the moment the populations are isolated and we're keeping an eye on them, mainly in London, um, and they also can carry prey. So at the moment they're of not a particular concern, but again, as I say, if they spread, they may be a concern. The other species we have in England are, so on the outside, you've got the noble and the narrow clawed. Now these are both European species and also under threat from invasive species. So both of them, although they're in the England, they don't prove a threat to ours. They, they don't carry plague. And again, they are fairly, um, they're, they're fairly nice and they sort of sit in the environment um, quite well. Now there are two animals in the, the, the aquarium trade. You've got the red claw and that's legally allowed in the UK. And that one's not temperate, it's a tropical species from Australia. But then underneath it, you've got this guy, this marbled crayfish. Now this one is a particular concern. It's illegal to have it in the UK because it is a temperate animal and it's parthenogenic, which means that it doesn't need two sexes to breed. So even if one animal ended up in our rivers, it could have extreme implications. So with all that in mind, when we started our project in 2008, we thought, well, let's have a look at the bigger picture. So we basically mapped the Southwest to see what was there. And we found actually that since the 70s, as you can see from the map, the, red claw, the, the signal crayfish had pretty much spread throughout the Southwest and our populations had retracted to only 18. We thought, what should we do about this? And so a group of esteemed professionals came together to have a little think to see what it was uh, we might like to do. And we hatched a cunning plan called the Southwest Crayfish Partnership. Now it was fairly timely because at, the, at that time, Natural England had a large body of funding, their Countdown 2010 funding. So we applied for a large grant and brought together all the specialists, all the people that knew about crayfish, were working on crayfish already, and really drawing in the experts to basically put our thinking hats on and work out what we're going to do to save this little animal. So we decided on five main strands of the project, and really they've stayed, stayed exactly the same. We haven't really moved from this. We had to map our counties, not just for the white claws, but to work out where the invasives were, what the real threats were and what the implications. We've established arc sites. Now these are safe sites where you can move threatened populations into. We've developed a very strong outreach communication program, hence one of the reasons I'm talking to you tonight. We've developed our captive breeding, a little bit more on that to follow. Uh, you haven't seen quite all of the animals I've got down in my buckets today. And we also started on invasive control. Obviously, we need to work on trying to control and reduce and restrict populations of invasive species. So working through these in a little more detail, how do we go about actually mapping counties? It seems quite a large thing to do, and it actually is quite a large thing to do. So there's a lot of licenses in logistics, and I really want to make this point tonight, that actually you can't just go and rummage in your rivers. As nice as it may sound, you have to be licensed. So myself and my team, we have uh, crayfish licenses. So I have two licenses. I have one from Natural England that allows me to survey, and I have a second license that allows me to handle them, to translocate, to move populations, but also to keep them here at home. I can't just basically have a tank of crayfish at my house, that would be silly and it would be irresponsible. You have to know what you're doing. The other thing you have to also have is environment agency permit, permits. Every single site has to have a permit so that they know where you are. Even if you're just basically picking up stones, you have to have permits. Now, every type of trap I use has one of these tags here. They can instantly see who I am what I'm doing and there shouldn't be ever any surprises because I tell them the dates and the times that I'm going on particular rivers and obviously we need to we need landowner permission you can't go stomping in someone else's river even if you fancy it so that's the licenses and logistics how do we actually find a little animal in a large stream well we have various different survey methods and this one here I am with um, Polly my uh, fantastic um, 
my fantastic partner in crime and also Nick who helped out um, from one of the ecologist places, um, one of the local firms. And here we are actually stone turning with nets. Now sometimes it's quite sedimenty, so you need to have nets. Where we're in chalk streams, uh, usually in Hampshire, and I know this is tiny, but we use things like bathoscopes, this thing, which is a viewfinder. And you can literally peer down it and um, turn your stones and have a look. Now sometimes that's great where you've got maybe populations in quite high density, but we also use types of traps. This one's an artificial refuge trap, and this is great because it's only a trap when you pick it up, so the animals are free to go in and out. Now crayfish love tiny spaces, so we give them a whole different suite of sizes to go in. We actually call them pan pipes, which is quite obvious for obvious reasons. And the great thing about this is that big ones go in the tubes, but the little guys, the young of the year, the hatchlings, they actually crawl in between the tubes and the plate. So it's a really fantastic way of getting all age classes. And you can keep them, here we are, you just keep them in a river, basically tuck them under the riverbanks, tied up securely, and you can just check them from time to time. And it's a really great way. It's not very intrusive. You don't go stomping about the river. You just go to your refuges. So it's quite an elegant one and really good where the populations are quite um, small and quite far apart. However, when you have populations uh, that are bigger or you've got deep water areas, baited trapping can be more appropriate. And here, I hope you can see in the picture, there's a little sort of pocket and that's where we put the bait. Now we tend to put marine um, species in, marine fish, something smelly like mackerel, and also there's no biosecurity issues from using a freshwater fish in a freshwater river. You never want to bring in contaminants. So we'll put these in and they're only allowed to be in, again, with tags, with permission, but only for 24 hours. And that's because once the animal goes in, it can't go out, it's basically inside the trap. And we don't want to make sure, we want to make sure that, that it's not too many animals in there for too long. Now I would say they've all got restricted apertures, so the opening is restricted, so that it can't catch things like otters. And if there are waterfowl in the area, then they're not allowed to be used. Now each one of these has to be tracked, so we use GPS and we record the location, because what goes in, has to come out obviously and so again these are really good for high density populations but where you've got low density perhaps not quite as good now I wanted to touch on this this is just a lovely story from last year when we were doing surveys of our rivers and we have one of our, our the moments in 10 years this is Holly Thompson she's my crayfish uh, hatchery manager manager she's fantastic she just lets me bang on all the time about crayfish and we had a fantastic moment where we went to a natural river and there was a proper population, not an arc site, but one naturally occurring with fantastically healthy crayfish. So that was just sharing my moment from last year with Holly. So touch so back onto arc sites, what are they? Well, Paul Bradley in 2008, he came up with a good description. It's basically somewhere which is uh, isolated, it's discreet, it's somewhere that's going to be safe from drying out, it's going to be relatively, hopefully, um, safe from invasion, and it can be either a river site or a still water site. Now if it's a river site, it means that either you haven't got invasives in that catchment or there's some sort of barrier to migration. So how do we go about assessing them? Well, it can take quite a long time. So we have, we have a kind of coarse filter, does it have water or permanently? Does it have other crayfish species? What kind of fish has it got in, if any? And it's, it sounds really crazy, but like even the other day, I was going, driving past this amazing looking pond, stopped there, was having a look, thinking, oh my goodness, this would be amazing for crayfish. Got talking to the um, owner and they said, oh, 25 years ago, it actually dried out. And then that's it, it's over, you can't have that. So it sounds um, obvious, but it's really good to find local knowledge when you're assessing it. So we look at how um, discreet it is, what kind of land use around it, and then once it kind of gets through that initial filter, we then start looking at other little things about it. So then we start the survey effort. So we don't just survey for crayfish and fish. Um, in this particular case, we actually did some seine netting to see what fish. If it's got predatory fish like carp or perch or eel, then your, your crayfish are never going to um, basically establish without getting predated. So that's really a no-go. But we also look for things like amphibians. If there are too many amphibians, they can actually be a problem to crayfish. Everything eats juvenile crayfish. So your juvenile newts, your Fs, 
they'll have a good chump on them too, especially great crested newts. And I would say that um, if it was an important great crested newt population, we wouldn't put crayfish in there because they can predate, but it's usually the other way around. But we also look at the invertebrates, not just to find out what's there for our little guys to chomp on, but also to make sure there's nothing really, really high priority in there because we don't want the crayfish messing up a balanced ecosystem. Now, once we've done our surveys, we do a lot of water sampling. So we look at it over the seasons to see what, this, what the water does and the temperature as well. We'll put data loggers in to make sure that it doesn't get too hot. We're always looking at how can we climate proof for obviously these very, very warm summers that we're having. And is there enough shading long term for that animal to survive? Now, once we're satisfied that yes, it's gonna work, we've got landowner permission, we've got our licenses in place, then we can do our translocation. So what do we do? So before, sorry, one, sorry, one more thing, sorry, before our translocation, if there's not enough refuges and habitat, then we'll pop some more in. So in this case, we actually put in lots of brush bundles, even though in the picture you can see lots and lots of great flag iris in the picture. But also we use these kind of crates that we got donated and put in engineered bricks with holes and lots of little uh, brush and twigs. And this is particularly good for the juveniles to basically hide in. And you can just pull them out and survey the whole little artificial reef, we call them. So we've done all this, we're ready, we've got our habitat sorted, and now we need to basically get some crayfish. Well, how do we do that? Well, we either take them from other populations or we captive breed them, as I've alluded to earlier. So when we bring them from a donor stock, a wild caught population, how do we choose them? Well, when we started this, this um, project, we had what? We had 18 populations left. So we did a kind of traffic light system with them. So red meant that it was really, really endangered and very, very close to a real high threat of invasion. Usually that means that you've got invasive crayfish literally marching up the river, very, very close. And therefore, if we don't move them, they are probably going to be extinct. Orange means that there's some sort of barrier, but those, there is a threat there. And green means that actually that site is almost acting as a natural arc site that either invasives aren't in the same catchment or actually that there's some sort of barriers to migration. Now, every time we um, do a translocation, we don't take all of the animals, we just take a proportion. We can't, we don't have any crystal balls. We can't say, do you know what, actually they really are going to become extinct. We just think they may do. So we take a proportion, not all of them. Now, as a rule of thumb, we'll take about 200 animals of equal sex ratio. And here's my boss, Grania. She's measuring, being very diligent. She was a fantastic uh, support. She learned very, very quickly um, how to measure hundreds of crayfish accurately. So a shout out, so thank you to Grania. Um, and so we measured them and we'll only bring them in of a certain size. They've got to be over approximately about five centimeters total length. Otherwise they get eaten by even smaller things like dragonfly. Once we've got our animals, um, and I should say, how do we get them? So by the survey methods I've already touched on, so by stone turning, set it up, setting up baited traps, and also putting in ARTs overnight. So, and if we don't get enough on one day, we'll go back and do a second um, translocation. So then we package them up in polystyrene boxes, and off we go, we tape them up and put them in an air-conditioned car and drive super, super carefully to our arc site. And usually they're very, very close. We try to always choose somewhere that's close as possible to the actual uh, river where we've um, chosen the animals. And then when we get there, we need to acclimate them. So we do this by basically making sure that not just the temperature, but also the water quality is okay for them. Crayfish have gills, they're super sensitive. They don't like change at all. They're quite fussy with it. So we have to do it very, very gently. And as we're acclimating them, we basically, so we basically do a little health check just to make sure that everybody is doing okay and that they still look healthy and that the journey hasn't compromised them at all. And then we find lots of little nice habitat. This is actually a still water site in Hampshire and here's Cam and he's choosing really nice little bits of habitat, little roots so that they can literally feel quite at home already at the beginning. And then how do we monitor them? So it's not just about setting up the arc site. It can take up to 10 years to actually, for an arc site to really establish and get recruiting. So these animals can take between four to five years to reach maturity in the wild. And they only breed once a year. 
And in all my years, the maximum eggs that they've ever had is 96. So that's not very many. And we estimate a survival of about five, 10 percent in the wild. So you can see it can take a, a really long time to um, basically establish. So this means that we do a long term monitoring. Usually with our oxites, we do biennial. So basically we'll do some one year and some the next. And with sites like this, a deep water lake site, we'll have ARTs tied up on buoys that we can then check periodically. Once it gets to a good size, we can do baited traps. But in a dim, deep water site such as this, it just wouldn't be appropriate to try and do stone turning. It would just be too deep. Now, sometimes we do do diver surveys. I've got a very long suffering husband um, who basically does quite a lot of diving for me. Um, and he will basically go out on a rebreather and do quite a lot of dive surveys as well, um, which is a fantastic help where you've got a large site. So a shout out to him as well. Here we are, this is local. This is um, one of my friend's farms. And again, we're doing um, a site looking for our ARTs round the sides with buoys on them to check them from time to time. And you can see this is not a very intrusive way of survey. It's very nice. And on a lovely day, it can be quite enjoyable, obviously very hard work as well. So what have we done with our arc sites? Well, over the course of um, a decade, we've set up 18 arc sites over six different counties, and we've got a sort of split of 50-50 still water to river sites. And with that, we have basically, um, um, we have, yeah, we're basically a split and we found, so there's, we've got about 55% of them showing that they're recruiting. So we're very pleased with that outcome because it's still early days. A lot of them are quite young sites. So the next thing I want to go on to is outreach. Um, I need to get this on record that obviously I'm always the white claw crayfish. And I, this isn't a scary one, Mark, because actually uh, we've got our face painting nailed now so we don't make small children cry anymore. Um, and we, it's, it's kind of hard. So this is Larry the lemur. He's an obvious choice. Everybody loves Larry. It's taken a while for people to love us as crayfish. Um, and we're not as iconic as a gorilla. So there has been a real challenge with the outreach program, trying to make people really love crayfish. And this is one of my remits obviously tonight is make you all fall in love with the crayfish and why you should care about preserving it. So with the outreach, we've done some fantastic things over the years. Um, this is a crayfish roadshow where we could bring in a big uh, soft play river and teach them various different things about food chains. What happens if you put a big baddie like a signal crayfish in? What happens to your ecosystem? We also get them out river dipping. And one of the key things we actually do is get them out washing their wellies. Because the thing with the crayfish plague and other invasive species is that it can actually sit on your gear. So it can sit in your wellies, it can sit on your clothes, it can sit in your dog's fur, it can sit everywhere. And basically with crayfish plague, it's got a kind of cyst phase and it can uh, stay dormant and alive for up to two weeks uh, in damp conditions. So it means if you accidentally end up enjoying and river dipping and playing in a river, especially now with this amazing weather, you can actually accidentally bring crayfish plague or little invasive plants or, or tiny hatchlings actually on the tread of your boots or in your fishing nets and not realize and then go to another river where there might be white claws and actually infect them with plague. So it's all about spreading and raising awareness. And what we did with the children after making them scrub their Wellington boots for quite a long time, we actually got them to fingerprint a crayfish to actually pledge that they were gonna check clean and dry their Wellington boots. And at the age of four, my daughter, that was one of her mantras, was cleaning her welly boots. So we know it can be done and we know that the children and the next generation are the ones to work on. So it's a really, really simple can-do message. Again, just to check clean dry. Now I'm going to talk to you about uh, the little guys and the captive breeding and what we've been doing. So this is another one of our strategy aims is to breed them. Recognizing that some of the populations are in such small um, and restricted populations that the only way to keep them alive is to supplement or to set up arcs for them. So we basically set up a Bristol Zoo hatchery in 2009 and we set this up as a biosecure unit. This means that there's no water coming into it from kind of a river or a stream. It's basically treated mains water. So it's completely secure. So it kind of acts as an arc site, if you like. And it's got four different systems, one of which is a public display for people to enjoy in our aquarium. 
Now this is the outside system. So it's basically got 13 tanks on a recirculation. That's what we call it. So it's got a filter in the middle and then we've got various different bits and bobs hanging off the filter to keep the water quality nice. And then we have heaters and chillers. And this is really important because obviously the hotter it gets, um, the more we need to chill it, the colder it gets, the more heaters. So I keep buying chillers and heaters, chillers and heaters, chillers and heaters to make sure that what we're trying to do here is kind of replicate the river environment. So we go from about five degrees in winter up to about 18, 19 degrees in summer. We want to try and make it as natural as possible. And that's because we breed the animals here. So we will bring in broodstock in, um, in autumn time. So we bring in males and females and we set them up, usually one male to two females, set them up in the tanks and let them uh, breed. Once the females have got eggs, we'll take the males out, give the females a break for a bit, and we keep the females and the males separate for the rest of the winter. Now, just before they hatch in springtime, they come into our indoor systems, the females. So we separate them up into these little tanks so we can keep a really close eye on the adults and see when the, when the um, juveniles are gonna hatch. Now we don't just do captive breeding, we also do captive rearing. And that's where we bring in females in the springtime buried. We call them uh, in berry because the eggs look like berries, which it makes good sense, I guess. Um, and so we bring them in in Berry um, in spring, just before they're going to hatch. And I want to, I put this uh, picture of Martin Frailing here. This is a big shout out. This, this guy, Martin Frailing, was at the Environment Agency for many years. And he has been my mentor and inspiration for white look claw for a crayfish. He can find you a buried female in any river, anywhere. He's superb. Um, I miss you, Martin, if you're listening out there tonight. Um, and what we've done is we adapt these bait pots for our crayfish. We drill holes in them. And then when we find a female with eggs, we pop her in with grass and water and we corral her in the side of the river until we found other animals. That way she doesn't start jackknifing and moving about with her eggs and she's not likely to lose any. Then we basically package her up in a polystyrene box and bring her into the zoo where we'll acclimate her to the same water temperature and quality. And then we'll gently release her into a little tube, a nice little refuge in her tank where she'll sit quietly and nicely until um, she, until the eggs hatch. What do they look like? Well, here we go. So this is when they hatch and it's brilliant because just before they're hatching, the eggs get this split color because you can see, I think, I hope you can see, on the top of them, they've got this kind of carapace and then they've got these two little uh, eyes. And so just before they're hatching, you see the eggs are split in color, but you see these two dots and that's when we get really excited at the zoo. Well, Holly and I get really excited at the zoo because we know that they're about to hatch. And this is called stage one. So they look like tiny crayfish, not like lobsters. Lobster, lobsters are planktonic. These guys actually look like their parents and they're stage one. So they need to have a molt on mum before they're ready to go. And this is stage two. So this is what they like, they, what they look like. And I thought, what, what better? And now we're going to sort of stop for a minute. Sorry. I thought, what better than to try and uh, show you close up what one looks like. So bear with me because I need to, there'll be a small pause. Mark, can you, uh, yep. can you talk about yourself for a minute? I'm not sure if this is going to work. I have every confidence. Oh dear. <laughs> okay. Right. You're going to have to tell me if you can. Um, not quite yet. Yeah, there we go. Can you see that? Yes. Okay, sorry. Oh. Can you see that? Sorry, I've had a bit too much coffee from all my muffling. <laughs> my hands are a bit shaky. Is that too shaky or can you see that? Okay. I can see it very well. Okay, so I'm going to put that back inside. So that one, right, I need to share my screen again. Problem is with wet fingers, it's very hard to do this. Um, okay, so basically um, that one is... Uh, Four, four weeks old now. So spent two weeks on mum and then uh, but now it's just had its first molt on its own. So that's from my hatchery. So here um, live today, we've got about 300 hatchlings uh, in my shed. So I thought, how, what better than to actually show you one? So you can see they're very, very vulnerable to predation at this size. They're tiny and that's why it can take so 
it's so hard to actually um, for them to survive in the wild. Now in captivity, we can actually get up to 100% surviving because we can look after them, we can split them up, we can make sure they get lots of food. So you can see it's a really, really good way of boosting your numbers rather than uh, relying on trying to do it in the wild. Now I always get asked what we, what we feed them. What do I feed that little chap? And what do I feed the big guys that I, well, one of which I've shown you? Well, it's a variety of food. So we start off, I start off by hatching the eggs. So every morning there's a bit of a ritual. I get up, I basically set up my Artemia brine shrimp eggs in salt water with, with a heater. And then I wait for them to hatch. And then I wait for 48 hours till those shrimps have got mouth parts. And then I gut load them with lots of yummy algae, the things I want the crayfish to eat. And then when they gut loaded for 12 hours, I then feed them to the juveniles. And what I do is I do this with um, other small defrosted plankton like rotifers and copiapods. So the idea is to sort of wean them onto the dead food, if that makes sense. So I basically feed them live food every day for about six weeks. And then by then they're pretty much just taking defrosted plankton. However, it doesn't stop there. Then we start bringing in the superfoods like Swiss chard. Um, that's a shout out to my vegetable plants. <laughs> With lockdown, these things are much, much easier, I find. So things like Swiss chard and kale and lots of different vegetables, and we blend them up into pellets and start feeding them because they're omnivorous. They basically will take both vegetables and plankton. So that's kind of it, a sort of planktony plant diet. Now, when the females, when they finished breeding, because when they're breeding, basically there's a critical point where you, what I, what I didn't say here is that basically, while they've got the um, juveniles on them, they stop eating entirely because there's a hormone that the juveniles produce that stops mum eating. Now, as soon as they start leaving her, even if they're in the same tank, they basically, that, that inhibition, that hormone goes, the inhibition goes and she's starving. So she starts eating them. So that's where there's a really critical point. That's why we put them in the small tanks so we can take her out. She then gets rewarded by a salmon and pea supper at my house anyway. Um, I do like to reward them for their hard work. And then after that, they will be health screened and released. Everything obviously is health screened before they go out. And uh, just a shout out really to uh, the fact that I'm now fascinated by building mer merchants. Who knew that I would take such a delight in engineer bricks and different shapes and sizes? Because as I've, as I've talked about, crayfish love different refuges. And actually, so when we, when we actually start rearing them when they're little, we use twin wall plastic. We got our inspiration from looking up at the roof of the crayfish shed and thinking, oh, we could use that for that hatchlings. And we put a little bit of gravel over the top and it's a great, great refuge. As they get bigger, the refuges get bigger until they end up in the kind of big boy engineered bricks. So where do we go? Where do we go with the juveniles? We release them, we do wild supplementations, we set up the arc sites, and some of them do have to be sampled. So some of them have to be sacrificed to make sure there's no novel diseases going into an environment. We also move them to other institutions and colleges for outreach displays. And some of them, as I say, we keep as broodstock so that we're not always taking lots of animals from the wild. And every time we release them, we actually pit tag them. So this is a passive integrated transport, sorry, a passive integrated transponder. It's the same thing as your cat and dog have. It's a little chip with a unique code. Now we inject it into their ventral abdomen surface, just under the skin, under the cuticle, and it will just sit there. I, we spent a year making sure, doing research to make sure that there was no um, survival or growth or fecundity breeding compromise with these tags. And once we were satisfied, we then knew we could tag them. The great thing about this is it, there's, a, there's a minimum size you can tag because obviously little ones are too small for something that is actually 8.2 millimeters long. So there's a minimum size here that we can release now, which actually is great because it means they're not so prone to predation. So it's a win-win. More importantly, a tagged animal can tell you heaps about the environment, how far they're migrating, how long they're living. I mean, these animals can live up to 10, 12 years. And also um, when the population is recruiting, when you find an animal that doesn't have a beak, you know that it is a new one. So it's a really useful resource. And our current hatchery focus, so at Bristol Zoo, we've got the Hampshire and Devon, we've got two, the last two remaining populations from both these counties that we're working with for supplementations and also for arc sites. And here at my uh, house, I work on Bath and Northeast Somerset. 
And I thought it was about time to show you a picture of my crayfish hatchery because I did want to take you on a virtual tour, but I thought perhaps that was a bit too complicated with the technology. So I'm not going to take you on a, on a zoomy doomy talk downstairs. I'm going to show, tell you, show you a picture. So here is the crayfish research unit. So this is where I've basically been doing my PhD. Um, I've got 24 little tanks. I can do lots of replicates of three different treatments at a time. And then I've got a big tank on the other side and lots of filtration. Um, and it was a fantastic thing to sort of set up. Um, and now having finished the research, it means that I can basically just um, breed lots of animals and hatch out. Um, and the animals that are currently being bred are about to go into a, once not those ones, but I've got some older ones and they're about to be released into an arc site close by, which is super exciting because it's gonna happen in the next couple of weeks. And what I've been really lucky is that Bristol Water have lent me a few uh, hatchery tanks at a local hatchery. Basically, I was driving around where I live and I saw a sign that said a hatchery and I thought, oh, I wonder. So I contacted Bristol Water and said, could I borrow some tanks? And so they let me rear my animals on so that they get to a big enough size where they can be tagged and released. So, they, the, so it's a shout out to Bristol Water for being fantastic partners. So I want to touch on crayfish control now briefly. So what are we doing? Well, it's stemmed from various different crayfish control trials. So there's been a lot of lab-based work, pretty much by, started by CFAS, looking at male sterilization and bait matrixes. And so with the bait matrix, that's actually as it sounds, crustacean-specific bait, but that hasn't been trialed in the wild yet. But the male sterilization, um, has been trialed and I'm going to explain a little bit more about this. So one minute, I'm not going to, shall I stop? Shall I share again? Um, sure, right. go for it. Okay, so with the male sterilization, right, can you see this? So this is a male, can you see that? Yep. And he's got these little claspers here, these are called gonopods. And with the male sterilization, now this is the only gory bit, close your ears chaps, but we sort of snip them off. And basically it means that he then, when he delivers spermatophores, he doesn't deliver them to the female's ventral surface. He will deliver them all over the place. So it means that he basically isn't fertilizing the eggs. Also, because he's big, he's kind of in control of the environment. So he will basically outcompete the, um, the youngsters. So he thinks he's breeding, he's suppressing the rest of the, the males from breeding, but he can't actually breed properly. So it can be a really, really uh, useful way of um, working out, trying to suppress populations. However, all of this stuff needs trapping as well. So there's been lots of science on trapping and the problem with trapping, and this is why when lots of people promote eating your, eating your crayfish, it just doesn't work. And the reason why is because trapping will only trap out the bigger animals. And those bigger animals are the ones that suppress the little ones from breeding. If you take out the bigger animals, what happens is you have a population explosion. So when people think they're doing the right thing by eating the crayfish in the local rivers, they're doing exactly the opposite. They mean well, but it just doesn't work. So we've recognized that control is a combination. There's no silver bullet unless you use biocide. Obviously that's inappropriate in a lots, of, lots of situations because it kills everything. So we can use male sterilization plus trapping or trapping with predators or a dewatering. And I'll explain a little bit more. So with the, um, this is basically a local, this is our site where we work, um, our Bristol Water Own site. And what we're doing here is we're trapping out every fortnight our crayfish, but we're also uh, going to add a predatory fish species. We're going to add perch because we are only trapping out the large animals. So the idea is also to add something small like a predatory perch, which is already in the environment, but not in significant numbers and try to get them to do the work for you. So it's all about a combination approach. Now we've also done some dewatering here, but as you can see, this is the top of the river but you're not gonna get all the animals out. So although you're gonna suppress and reduce the population, it's not gonna be completely removed. However, where you've got say a concrete structure, in this case, yes, we, we did 100% removal. And once you've done a, fish, uh, a crayfish removal, obviously you have to move the fish. So in this scenario, we basically put the fish in a big tub 
and got the tractor to wheel it up to the river to release them upstream so that they weren't harmed in the process of dewatering. And it's a shout out to the team. So I want to shout out again to Neil and Holly and all our fantastic volunteers. We, we rely so heavily on at, with sandwich placement students and volunteers. They are always absolutely amazing, even when it's absolutely torrential rain. So just a big thank you. They, they're always cheerful, no matter how rainy and wet it is out there. So just the final part of my section is just to talk a little bit about research and the fact what we've been doing. And just to really say that we've been looking at aquaculture, how to breed a crayfish, and also basically tagging so that we can assess wild survival. All my career at the zoo has been for captive breeding for reintroduction. And it's great to be able to validate that it actually works. The best way we can do this is by tagging and tracking those animals once released. So we've done various different things, things like refuges. We found out they like black ones and gray ones rather than red ones and white ones. We've looked at density. We know how many little guys we can, we can keep in a tank, when to split them up. We know that we need to keep them in single sex groups. We know that the males, even when tiny, get quite dominant over the females. We've worked these things out. We've worked out what's the best food for them to maximize our growth and survival over time. And we've done quite a lot of really nice tracking. So we've done the pit tagging, but we've also done some acoustic telemetry where we actually tagged 12 crayfish and picked them up with these hydrophones and looked at them for over um, 12 months to see how they utilized a site. So there's lots of interesting things that you can do to try and maximize the benefit of your project. You really need to make sure that any project is based in good science and facts so that you know that it's actually working and that you're doing a good job. So I thought it was good to reflect a decade on and what we've done and what we've achieved because it does always feel a bit like a gloomy doomy story for the white claw crayfish. However, we have increased sites in the southwest, not numbers, but the sites by 70% now with all of our arcs. We've luckily, we've been working, it's a really great landscape scale partnership project. We've got national and regional crayfish strategies now running throughout where everyone's really joined up thinking to save this species. We've got our hatcheries, we've got public displays, we've absolutely developed an outreach program so that you guys are all gonna absolutely love crayfish. When you, when you finish tonight, you're gonna reflect on this amazing little crustacean. And we run courses, we're publishing, but also now we're culminating in a crayfish handbook, which I think is a really important, nice outcome for the project to actually write a book for practitioners on all the experience from all the experts and what we've done in 10 years to save this species. So what can you do to help? Well, I think you know now what I'm going to say. You can check clean and dry. The really great news is that hot water that comes out of your tap, if you stick your stuff in it for about five minutes, and if you go a little bit hotter then, even better and a little bit longer. But if you put your kit in there and dry it out, your wellies, put it in that sunlight, UV sunlight's great. It will help spread, stop spreading things like crayfish clay, and more importantly, other invasive species. It's so simple and it will make a massive difference to this project. Now Mark, have I got time to do my little three minute film or shall I stop there? What do you reckon? I, I say go for it. Okay, so I just thought there was an old film that we put together. It's only three minutes, just a little bit to try and bring the crayfish to you because it's a bit sort of static. Um, so I'm gonna just basically play it. Uh, so bear with us.
fantastic. Okay. Um, <laughs> now I've got to get back. <laughs> Can you see that again? Yep. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just to finish with a shout out really, a massive thank you to not just the, the zoo for supporting this, um, this project and plan for so long and to my amazing team, Holly and Neil. A thank you to all the amazing crayfish professionals that I work with over the years and to all our huge, the huge amount of funding. We could not have done it without all our project partners and all the expertise. It's been a fantastic journey to get where we are today. So uh, thank you very much. And then just to basically, yep, to finish off to, as Mark said, um, we've been shut for quite a while. We're now operating at Wild Place. The Bristol Zoo is still shut. So uh, we would very much welcome if you could share the link to our appeal or support us if you can to make sure that our conservation projects still carry on going because a lot of it relies on our uh, gate spend and you guys out there. But more importantly, just to thank you for listening tonight and staying with me and sorry for the technical glitches. Um, yeah, Zoom isn't my kind of uh, go-to medium for doing these sort of things. Right, handing over to Mark for a few questions. Jen, that was amazing. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mark. You're the only person who clapped. I once saw that can laughter or clapping. <laughs> no, that's because everybody's muted themselves, but I can see people are already starting to ask questions on the chat. I actually had a quick question of my own. So apparently you battle crocodiles as well? When, uh, yeah, did I, see, did I see some sort of crocodile on the grass in one of your pictures? That's <laughs> What's going on with that? <laughs> That's just a prop for the people that with keen observation skills. <laughs> oh, right. Okay. No, actually, that's one species I haven't worked with. Stop being cheeky. <laughs> right, I'll, <laughs> I'll move on to, to people's questions. Do you want um, me to stop my sharing my screen or what? Do um, you can things? do if you want. Sure. Um, so lots of people are lots of people are saying a huge thank you and and telling you what an amazing job that you're doing. Um, if you can, you actually see the chat. You can probably see the questions coming in. Uh huh. Yes, I can. Um, uh, I can't see any questions. I can just say. Just so far, mostly you. congratulations. Uh, how would I be able to get involved, volunteer? There's my first question. <laughs> um, we do accept volunteers. Uh, we, we have sandwich placement students for most of the year. Um, and so that kind of um, takes up quite a lot of space. Um, but we do have a volunteer team. So uh, you saw my email. So if you'd like to email you, I, uh, email me, sorry. Uh, I can give you more details on coming to join us. Um, what percentage do you need to take out? Ooh. Yeah, this is always really hard and I get really, really sad. And actually the other day I was quite tearful having to take out um, some animals. So it can be, it depends on the numbers. So if we're releasing 80, we might take out uh, maybe five animals. Um, but I'd like to say that if anything dies or along the way, we also health screen them. So we kind of, we always know the status of our hatcheries as well. Um, but we do have to take out, and it's not like when we did our water vol reintroductions, you can just swab them. Unfortunately, you do have to uh, euthanize them, um, and it's just really tough. Um, so I don't want to talk about that anymore. <laughs> uh, can the crayfish plague be treated once it has been found in a population? No, it can't. There is no known cure. Um, and with signal crayfish, you can't actually see whether they've got it. So you actually have to look at it at cellular level. Cellular level. So you have to do some microbiology. They don't present with it. So some crayfish carry it, some of the signals, and some don't. You can screen the water for it. So we're doing quite a lot of environmental DNA work where you can pick up whether the water's got it. But again, it's not a fail safe. Um, you can get false positives and negatives. It depends on the amount of water, the amount of plague in it. Um, there's no cure. There's, there's a small tiny ray of hope in the fact there's a couple of populations in mainland Europe of white claws 
that are now uh, showing some resistance to plague. Um, and obviously, if we can find one in the UK, then I will be breeding it um, and trying to represent that. And there's some really, really clever crayfish scientists looking at the molecular levels and why it is that they carry it and don't get infected and our animals get infected. So there's a lot of science going on to try and work out the plague aspect. Sorry, I'm babbling on about that. Right, next question, sorry. <laughs> you can just shut me up, Mark, just say stop, and I'll just stop. Absolutely not. Um, any more questions? Oh, I think, have I got, have I done them all? Yep, so if anyone has any questions that they would still like to ask, um, as Jen mentioned, you, ha you have Jen's email, but also feel free to ask questions on the Bristol Zoo Facebook page. Jen, are you okay with that? If, if questions come in through the yeah. Facebook page, then we can always pass them on to you that way. Absolutely. Um, so yes, um, oh, we have got another one. Um, yes, absolutely. And I'm on Twitter as well. So anyway, I'm very, very happy to answer questions. Um, I've got another one. Are you looking at increasing the radius of your, yes, we're always on the lookout for arc sites. Um, as I alluded to earlier, we've got another crayfish arc site uh, happening in the next couple of weeks. Um, and we've got hopefully one more this year. Um, and we are always looking to expand. I mean, there's a lot of other practitioners in other counties doing similar work to me as well. So we're trying to kind of join up thinking, but yes, we're always trying to expand. I'm always on the hunt. When I'm driving around, the thing I look out for is nice bodies of water, especially on train journeys. You always see loads of water when you're going through a train, going on a train, it seems. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, I would just say that last lecture quite a few people asked about Bristol Zoo opening and how that was going to work. All I would say if any of you have questions please go to the Bristol Zoo website there you can find all the details about whether and when how we're planning to open and what you can do um, do to visit us. Jen that talk was amazing and there was it was really cool to see the cute little crayfish thank you for that that That's was okay. that was amazing they want their dinner now i need to go feed them they're looking at yeah. me like why are we here and why are we not being fed i'm i'm way over from feeding them so i need to crack on and go and feed the hatchery now but thanks again to everybody for listening tonight Fantastic. thank you mark for helping me with my dreadful technical skills no that was great and um, so i'm going to have a quick talk about to the next lecture if that's okay so jen if you want to if you want to do feed, uh, feed your crayfish go go right yep, ahead okay i'm gonna leave thanks mark and um yep that's it bye bye everybody thank you okay so i just want to let you know that the next lecture in the series is going to be dr amanda weber talking about bristol zoo conservation projects in madagascar with blue-eyed lemurs and blue-eyed ibis that's not going to be in two weeks but three weeks time um, but as always i will send out announcements with the links to to zoom so um, if you want to join the mailing list then you can send me an email um, mabrahams at bristolzoo.org.uk um, and then i'll add you to the mailing list um, da, 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 da. And I guess the last thing to say is happy, happy National Insect Week, everyone. Thank you very much for, for joining us. Um, enjoy the beautiful weather and have a fantastic fortnight. Lovely to see you all. Bye-bye.